it's just the arrow button, right? So it's just, just the arrow button to flip it. Yeah. In here. Good morning. Can everyone? Obviously, you can hear me <laughs> that way. Uh, my name is Lily Troya. Um, I am a graduate student at Simmons College, uh, about to finish in just a couple weeks. And um, this is a project that actually emerged out of a class um, that I'll talk about a little bit more. And after me will be Bryce Rowe and Leanne Galletly, uh, two more students at Simmons. So uh, our project is looking at documenting music subcultures with oral history. A uh, little bit about the project background. It started out as an oral history class uh, taught by Janet Seha at Simmons College. She's a new audiovisual and cultural heritage archives professor that Simmons just brought on uh, that definitely recognizes a gap in our uh, faculty previously in terms of film preservation and, and audiovisual collections. Um, we spent a lot of time in the class researching oral history theory and practice, discussing ethical concerns, uh, the connection to community archives and activism as well, um, really uh, stressing development of a fundamental uh, and a th um, a foundation in literature and theory. Um, we had to go through institutional review board um, process at Simmons, uh, which was not that difficult actually, and um, there is a lot of discussion in the oral history world right now about trying to get oral history removed from the requirements of IRB training, um, but the uh, parameters of IRB training for an oral history project are us usually a, a less higher um, uh, mark that you have to meet than uh, heavier social science human research, but because you are using human subjects, you do at a lot of institutions have to go through IRB training. Um, we then developed vigorous project plans uh, based on theoretical foundations, uh, talked a lot about ethical concerns. Uh, included with in this was um, development of our interview guide and questions, focusing a lot on not um, developing leading questions, really establishing a level of comfort with your interview subject to start, also very technical basics like um, including recorded embedded metadata at the beginning of your um, interview about the location and the uh, person that you're interviewing just in case for some reason the file ever got separated from the metadata. Um, we had to craft and execute consent and release forms, um, which was especially interesting thinking about digital media today because a lot of consent forms originally developed for oral history projects do not reflect the desire of um, archives or libraries to put materials online. Um, so that's something that you definitely want to walk through with your interview subjects very carefully so they understand the full parameters of what you would like to do with these collections. I think in the past a lot of People were used to the idea of oral histories being locked away in some vault and that no one would ever really see them unless someone specifically requested. But now, uh, you know, with um, obviously text searchable um, indexes, transcripts, you know, people can be found very quickly. Um, and if they're talking about private, personal things, you definitely want to make sure that your interview subjects know that this could be uh, available and easily found on the web. Uh, we also went through and practice cataloged our materials and addressed long-term digital preservation plans, um, discussed how as an individual archiver um, you would go about um, preserving your files and your collection. And then also an interesting part of the class was um, we had to develop a digital story that reflected on our projects. Um, we used iMovie for that, and I, I just want to say uh, all three of us, um, none of us had any prior digital recording experience. Um, none of us had ever done oral histories before. We'd had some various AV experience, but this is really a type of project that any institution, regardless of resources, I think could endeavor to take on to expand um, their collections and to reach out to their communities so that you can get different voices and perspectives represented. In fact, there was one person in our class that did the entire project just with her iPhone. So you really don't even have to have um, you know, a microphone other than your, you know, your smartphone. So now we're just gonna just talk a little bit about each of our individual projects. The reason we ended up submitting for this um, festival was because we all ended up doing music subculture projects where we used oral history to document some sort of grassroots music subculture that hadn't been included in the historical record anywhere yet. Um, my project looked at the Funky Bitches, which is a women's social and service group that grew out of the uh, Fish fan world, P-H-I-S-H. They're a jam band from Vermont that is 
uh, been around since the early 80s and are very hugely popular despite not being part of the mainstream. <clears throat> so a little bit about the Funky Bitches. Um, they were originally established in the late 90s, kind of at the emergence of online community culture. Um, they were specifically dedicated to forming a women-oriented network of social friends for fans of the band Fish. Um, the name of the, the group is after a blues song that the Fish would cover, obviously spelled with a P, uh, F, not a PH, but they twisted it to be the little kitsch reference to Fish. Um, some of the aspects of the Funky Bitches included an anchor program. Um, in the late 90s, uh, when Fish was touring at a lot, a lot of large stadiums in the country, a lot of these places were sports arenas that had bathrooms that were not very friendly for women uh, attendance because they assumed more male people or more males were coming to these venues. So the anchor program would set up a set of contacts at each concert along a tour and um, stock the bathrooms with bags full of tampons, condoms, emergency contact numbers like rape crisis hotlines, uh, things that were not easily accessible pre-smartphone era. Um, and they also had a mentor program with older fans who would partner with younger fans to help them feel less intimidated by a, a scene that definitely had a lot of cultural rules and systems that were hard to understand if you were new to it. Um, it was a pretty big group and they still are in existence. Um, they had over 2,000 members, 5,000 since it, in its inception. Uh, there were articles in the Rolling, Rolling Stone, New York Times, Entertainment Wheatley that all talked about uh, the funky bitches and their role in the scene. Um, so a lot of people wonder, well, why the band Fish? Why would a group emerge around a specific band? Um, so Fish is really a high-grossing concert sale band that doesn't really have songs on the radio that much. Uh, they're part of this post-Grateful Dead jam band culture where people tour with the band because each show is, uh, has a lot of improvisatory elements, so everyone is unique. So there's this sense that you never want to miss a single show because you would never be seeing the same thing again. It's really about the shared live music experience. And so the, the culture and the audience becomes just as much of an integral part of that as the folks on stage. Um, there's a lot of subcultural semiotics and systems that occur. Uh, there's a, a very vibrant lot scene, which is basically a carnival of um, ad hoc merchants that follow the band around, set up and sell things from t-shirts to grilled cheese sandwiches to illegal drugs. Um, there's, uh, I mean, it's a really huge carnival that will um, uh, follow every single concert. The fish, fish also emerged in this rise of internet culture, which I think is very interesting. Um, the, the, versus the Grateful Dead, there um, was this huge emergence of message boards, listservs in the late 90s, and the fish scene was really one of the groups that started using um, online forums to co connect and collaborate. Fish, like many jam bands, allows free recordings and tradings of their concert recordings. Um, so there's a really active tape trading uh, group, a culture that had ar already existed that would, uh, was just enhanced by the potential of digital um, network technology. Um, but the other reason that the Funky Bitches emerged out of uh, the fish scene was because it was a very male-dominated scene, full of a lot of authority-based community hierarchies. Those who had gone to more shows, had more information, were seen as elders and the ones that had the most right to be there in some respect. There's a, uh, a lot of these message boards that emerged had really, um, you know, ranging from uh, just kind of disregard for female opinions to outright uh, sexual harassment, um, very extreme. And it, the um, emergence of the Funky Bitches actually triggered upon an instance where uh, a female who had been posting on a fish message board was basically threatened with rape. Um, and so a group of women and women-friendly men decided that this would be a really necessary thing to create a safe forum for female fans. So I had three major research questions that I was looking at in my project. Uh, the first was, what were the circumstances and subcultural conditions that compelled women fish fans in the late 90s to organize in such a way? Um, two, what was the role of online forums uh, in the development of grassroots music fan communities during the late 90s? And what, if any, is the connection between involvement in women-focused music fan cultures and the performance and enactment of sub subcultural identity? Uh, so in my research planning, I pulled from theoretical foundations of ethnomusicology, which had been my previous background uh, disciplinary area, 
as well as popular and fan culture studies, social psychology, feminist and empowerment theory, communications and performance studies. Um, because there hasn't been a lot of scholarly literature written about the funky bitches, although there are, I have found scholars in various places that are writing about jam band culture, deadhead culture, and at, at times fish. Um, but I also mined through a lot of message board and listserv archives um, that I was able to obtain by having contact with the original founding member of the organization. Uh, you know, developed an interview guide, scheduling. I had ethical concerns that I wanted to consider, um, including uh, folks that I interviewed that discussed things like drug use, sexual assaults, uh, you know, very um, intense topics, I would say. Uh, just some information about the software and equipment that I used, uh, which um, the equipment I all rented, or rented for free from Simmons Lab, um, but like I said, you could easily do it on your iPhone. Uh, Twisted Wave is a app that is downloadable that's a um, high quality stereo recording app that a lot of journalists use. It's not free, but it's pretty cheap and it's just a one-time purchase and it syncs with Pro Tools. Um, it's a really, really powerful editing, uh, record, vo uh, sound recording tool for your phone. And then I uh, did a lot of editing with iMovie GarageBand. And then I also use an open source online um, uh, interface, Otranscribe, which is um, just a website that also is accessible offline that helps you timestamp and transcribe things on your own. Uh, there were a couple pitfalls that I hit on my project, including the fact that as someone who uh, was a funky bitch, um, some of these people were my friends. And I realized that in discussing the parameters of the consent form and what I was intending to do with the project, my, one of my closest best friends um, really didn't pay attention because we were such good friends. And after the fact, when she realized that a lot of the things that she was saying were going to be available online, she became very uncomfortable and we had to have a, 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 an additional conversation about that and I've since made her content private. And with my grand intention of having this as a full digital collection, um, I'll have to reconsider whether or not I wanna include her portion. So I definitely would encourage you, if you are doing this from a, a personal or community um, archiving perspective, to really be clear with your interview subjects and recognize any kind of uh, barriers that your personal relationships might um, cause. So I just want to play a sample of, we're going to do a couple interview clips here. This is a clip with Tara Fowler. Um, she is the, she was the founding member of the Funky Bitches, um, and she still, as a volunteer, organizes her time to keeping it organized. Um, they're now a private Facebook group. They don't have an online forum anymore. But this is her talking a little bit about the formation of the Funky Bitches and why they felt it was necessary. Do we have and the stuff? conversation, you know, was unfiltered. Like there was no, we didn't approve messages that were on it. Mm -hmm. Anybody could post. And it was pretty good on fish women. On fishnet though, there was a lot of like, why, are you, why do you guys have to be in existence? Um, why do women have to talk separately? What are you going to talk about? There was a lot of, you know, this is unnecessary. Um, nobody could really understand why. And we had a. We, in private, privately, we came up with a list of reasons why we should exist. And one of them was because we wanted to do more, as women, wanted to do some community outreach um, ideas and that were outside of like the regular talking about music realm. But mm -hmm. we felt it was necessary because we'd all on tour, uh, at shows, seen women that were kind of lost or maybe were in an abusive relationship or on drugs, um, needed help. There was always like, there was uh, this, I'm, I'm still today, you know, um, in any situation, bad, I mean, in any scene you get this, well, especially when, you know, there's a lot of drugs around in music. So there were women that needed help. Um, and, all of the women that were posting on Rec Music, we all seem to be pretty strong women with our head on our shoulders. So we wanted to just um, help other people. That was a big common thing. And I really. I'm just going to stop that there. So that's just a little sample. I conducted three interviews thus far for my project. Um, I did do them all video. 
uh, but we had the option of doing sound only also, which there's a lot of people in the oral history world that are very strong proponents of just audio, which is interesting conversation in and of itself. Um, but now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Bryce Rowe, who will discuss her portion of the project. Just the arrow, please. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hello, my name is Bryce Rowe. Um, so, for my oral history project, I conducted an oral history of a group called Open Signal. Um, it's an artist collective based in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, concerned with the state of gender and race in experimental electronic based sound and art practices. Um, they formed in 2014 by Asha Tamarisa and Caroline Park. They're both PhD students. Um, in like an electronic music program at Brown. And um, Asha is my best friend from undergrad, so that was part of, part of the inspiration. Um, I studied ethnomusicology as well in my undergrad, and we took some classes together. Um, and in our uh, electronic music history class, there were, I remember she and I both commented on the fact that there were no women on the syllabus. We approached our professor about it, and um, he was like, yeah, go do your own project on that. Um, which we found pretty insulting. Uh, <laughs> and so, so this, my sort of inspiration for this was, um, you know, Asha had gone on to do this, all this great work at Brown as an artist, um, and then was addressing these really important issues in terms of who is actually represented in this music culture. Um, and so I went about it with the idea that I was sort of sharing this success story, and um, as I take you through my project, um, just sort of outline the ways that you're project can really change as you conduct your interviews and to not go into it um, with, uh, you know, too firm of an idea of what you expect to get out of it because it can really go in, in a lot of different directions. Um, anyway, the group hosts, um, they host uh, technical skill shares, uh, critical discussions, live performances, they invite, um, invite guest artists, uh, and are just really conscious of who, um, who's represented. They make sure that their uh, festivals, are um, an accurate representation of uh, the diversity of performers that actually exist in this um, realm. Just a couple pictures. Um, really important that all their events are free. They also released an album. Um, and this one down here, that's actually Asha and Caroline performing. So I also interviewed, started out with interviewing three members, including the founders, uh, with the aim of expanding this project. Um, eventually. Uh, and I wanted to investigate the artist's personal histories, their creative processes, how issues of gender and race uh, may or may not inform their work, how their work both as artists and through Open Signal might bring about more diversity and awareness of the broad spectrum of artists that have historically and continue to be underrepresented by the media. Um, and then to document and explore how electronic music histories are contained and contested in the present and how the um, electronic music practices can be utilized to destabilize um, gender and race assumptions. So in our class, we talked a lot about like filling in the gaps um, and oral history being a tool for doing that. Um, and while I wanted to do that, I was because I was conducting a project on a group that was acting um, in the present, I really also wanted to document how they were um, coming up against uh, this culture that was um, had uh, an air of masculinity that had, you know, was rooted in the way that histories were written about that um, musical practice, but was never really accurate. So, uh, similarly, we grounded all of our projects with some theoretical foundations. I also had an ethnomusicology background. Um, and again, I just wanted to um, gain an understanding of the, um, uh, how we could reimagine histories as accurately diverse. Um, and so I tried to become aware of um, how it was being documented more in the present. This is an image from um, uh, an audio um, online forum. Um, and they were pretty, 
It's a lot of sexism, a lot of bigot bigotry, um, violence even against women on these on the online forums, which is, um, you know, obviously there are a lot of women out there uh, who are artists as well, and these are the, these are the forums where the kind of discussions happen, um, and they're certainly not welcoming. Um, which plays into the ethical concerns as well. Um, visibility was a huge part of the project, but I had to think about how I would want to share it because there's also a lot of backlash on these online forums against anybody who addresses, um, who addresses it. Um, I did do all of my interviews audio only. I was just working on a really old laptop at the, at the time, and so for practical reasons, I didn't feel comfortable uh, with the large file size of video. Um, I also did them all remotely. Um, and so I used QuickTime to record and then uh, Soundflower two channels, just like a free little program you can download, um, creates two channels and gives you much better sound quality. So, um, yeah. Oh, skip this one? Okay. So uh, I'm not gonna share my interviews because we're running out of time, but if you wanna ask me more questions about them, you can. Uh, basically, the big takeaway for me was um, just the amount of work that they were putting into this. Um, left them very little time to work on their own artistic endeavors. Um, so, like, all of their effort was going into trying to change the culture that they were operating in. Um, and so, it wasn't so much like this big success story as really documenting the kind of work that goes into um, creating spaces for artists to do their own work. Thank you. So I'm just going to roll through really quickly since we're a little short on time. But my name's Leanne Galletly. I'm also a student at Simmons getting my MLIS. And when I'm not getting my MLIS, I help run a music festival in upstate New York called the Otis Mountain Get Down, starting in September, September 9th this year. And so I knew I wanted to do um, the founding members of Otis as my oral history project. And um, Otis is, is sort of like a special music festival. We have 2,000 people come in every year, and it's sort of it's in the woods, and it's in um, it's actually at an old ski area, community ski area. And so I wanted to find out a lot of the history of of the area and the location, and why Otis feels really special when you're when you're actually there for the festival. And so that was a lot of what I was looking for in my interviews, and then. What I kind of want to talk about really quickly is just what we used and what was successful doing in oral history. So I first had to convince everyone to do it with me, which took a little convincing. And eventually, I'm going to interview all 13 founding members. And then I also used um, Twisted Wave, the same as Lily, which was really helpful. You can download it on your iPhone. And it has great sound quality. And you can just upload it onto iTunes into MP3. So that was super helpful. And I also used Otranscribe to do the transcriptions, which was also helpful just to have um, for, for reference and for using the interviews. And then we also, these are the narrators that I've done thus far. Um, and we also just wanted to wrap up really quickly by saying this is something that you can do in your institution. None of us had any experience doing oral history or using iMovie, and it was, it was really easy, it was really intuitive, and it's been a great process just to have in our collections. And for Otis, we're keeping them um, in our archive, and we just have, have the, them on, uploaded on our, on our Google Drive. So we think they're a great way to highlight your collection and to supplement it to reach out to your community or see community values. And if we have time, do we have any time? Um, no, it's fine. Sure. Okay. And so that. Oh yeah, and we had a, a couple resources that we can leave up as um, Emily's getting ready, and that was some things that really helped us. The oral history in the digital age by Doug Boyd really walks you through doing any oral history project and making an interview guide and getting ready. So thank you.
Um, hello. Um, today I'm going to describe how the Digital Library Branch at the National Agricultural Library is creating information ecosystems for our patrons and have digital collections, exhibits, and a new magazine. I will also share some of the background perspective for our exhibits as viewed through the lens of information behavior studies and a specific model for information users. The National Agricultural Library is one of four national libraries and contains the world's largest collection of materials devoted to the agricultural sciences. We hold over three and a half million USDA reports and 13,000 periodicals. Here's a sample of these serials and reports that we are currently digitizing to accommodate full public access. While we have a large reading room that is open to the public, we do not receive as many visitors as we once did prior to the digital age. And I wish I could uh, say otherwise, but I took this photograph when we were open. <laughs> this trend is reflected in the larger picture of all research libraries. The number of reference transactions and circulation figures have been decreasing over the past dozen years, as seen in this figure from the Association of Research Libraries. The number of staff at NEL has gone down as well. This lack of in-person visitors is spurring us to meet our patrons where they are with fully digital materials that can be accessed from anywhere at any time. NEL has partnered with the Internet Archives to convert all of our holdings that are either products of USDA work or are out of copyright for other reasons. This is how the National Agricultural Library's holdings appear within the Internet Archives interface. Unfortunately, many of our users find this interface somewhat difficult to navigate. The metaphor of a PDF in the forest came out of my reaction to this display. While Internet Archives offers a robust storage capacity, we have over 100,000 items. Accessing specific items is challenging for the user who is not familiar with our holdings. In order to expand upon this effort and make it part of a larger digital in initiative, some of these materials are being used as the basis of exhibits and as subjects of a new digital magazine about NEL's digital general collection. Omeka is the software platform for our digital library branch exhibits and Drupal is being used for the magazine. Um, Omeka is being represented at, uh, at the fest. I just came from one Omeka uh, session on Omeka S, their newest version, and there are some others, other, I think there are two other presentations on Omeka. Um, it's a project of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. And um, I won't read these off. It, I find, I have, as I've worked with Omeka, I've found it very good at item storage and rep, item representation. It is a little difficult to customize the interface. That, that is my, my biggest uh, challenge with Emeka right now. As part of the larger digital initiative at NAL, I developed these user personas to guide our work in the digital library branch. The personas incorporate patterns of user needs and information seeking behavior that have been documented in research studies of agricultural scientists and practi practitioners, as well as consumers. They also include my own experience and that of my colleagues hearing and answering user questions at the reference desk. They are also aspirational. They include descriptions of the kinds of users and tasks that our work aims to support. Perhaps the central persona is that of the scientist. We work to meet the needs of this audience through our new platform for digital library content PubAg contains citations to peer-reviewed journal literature that are used by the USDA scientific community. It is publicly accessible as well. We are also providing access to data sets for scientific inquiry. Ag Data Commons is another resource designed with the scientists in mind. Another user persona we look to frequently is that for the public. Resources such as nutrition.gov are designed to fill the agricultural information needs of our citizen users. 
Our user personas are a way to place our audiences within a larger domain of information needs and information seeking behaviors. Some of the specific areas we target are policy support, academic research, and practical knowledge. The domain of historical interest is one of our newest initiatives. The longer I worked on the exhibits and the magazine, the more I realized that I could not connect these projects to any of our existing personas. So I returned to the literature of information behavior and discovered the work of Robert A. Stebbins. Um, he is a sociologist and he has spent um, his career studying um, what he calls uh, the world of serious leisure. And he has published a lot, a lot of monographs and journal articles, and this is probably the most seminal article um, as far as the library world is concerned. Um, his study of serious leisure um, is defined as a systematic pursuit of an amateur, hobbyist, or volunteer core activity that people find so substantial, interesting, and fulfilling that they launch themselves on a leisure, leisure career centered on acquiring and expressing a combination of its special skills, knowledge, and experience. I imagine going to fish concerts might uh, represent a serious leisure pursuit. Uh, the serious hobbyist will expend significant personal effort acquiring and using a combination of specially acquired knowledge, training, experience, or skill. Acquiring these latter four is basically defining a career in serious leisure is all about. And then finally, some important knowledge is gained by participating in the social world surrounding the topic at hand, identified here as social world information, AKA funky bitches. Um, so as an example of connecting this user persona to our exhibits, um, this is our, our newest exhibit. Um, it uh, covers a now defunct USDA unit, uh, the Bureau of Home Economics. One of the functions of the Bureau was the design of functional work clothes for rural men and women. As I learned about this work carried out in the 1940s, I found that there are current communities of serious hobbyists who collect vintage sewing patterns designed by the Bureau. They share the resources and knowledge on wikis, on Flickr, they sell patterns on eBay. And I, um, I used uh, these collections of resources as a way to um, come up with the organization of the site. The exhibit contains subsections on work clothes, children's clothing, and kitchen designs, all initiatives of the Bureau of Home Economics. Another exhibit I would like to describe is Frost on Chickens. This covers the time when the poet Robert Frost worked as a poultry farmer in rural New Hampshire and wrote fiction for poultry trade journals. This relates to the current social world of backyard chicken hobbyists. This exhibit contains historic materials on chicken farming practice and egg production, in addition to a review of the Robert Frost farm. The next exhibit is on the current and historical practices of local food production and farmers markets. The world of the current foodie hobbyist is grounded in local food production and has relevance to the way these kinds of products have been supported by the Department of Agriculture over the last century. The local food exhibit contains an overview of this area of agricultural production as well as sections on the history of farmers markets and a description of a 1914 farm to table initiative designed to connect rural farmers with urban customers through local foods. And finally, um, the newest uh, exhibit it has not launched yet is on the history of home food canning. And again, there's a large group of serious hobbyists who uh, live in this world and they can their own food and they go to pick your own farms. The exhibit covers the development of standard canning practices and how they were shaped by historical forces such as World War I and World War II. I think the construct of the serious hobbyist is a useful one. It has helped me to find ways to structure our exhibits and I think it has relevance to other resources such as the exhibits of DPLA. 
And the last thing I want to share is our new Drupal-based NEL digital magazine that also sits within this information ecosystem. And again, this is new and has not been launched yet, so it's not publicly available. But um, I did make um, a little screencast of our prototype. I see the magazine as a showcase for NEL's historic general collection and also as a way to highlight segments of the larger exhibits. For example, this story about the earth roads of rural America is based on the section of the local food exhibit that described the role that the parcel post played in the farm to table movement of 1914. The delivery of local food to urban customers required passable roads in the countryside so that mail carriers could pick up orders from the farmers. And as you can see, this uh, story in the magazine uh, contains excerpts from uh, several of our publications. Uh, the, these are all USDA reports. The USDA, it was a, a, at one time, it was not only a Bureau of Home Economics, it was a Bureau of Roads um, to help rural citizens and farmers um, get to, to, and, to and fro. Um, and here's how uh, this section of the exhibit um, looks in the, in the local food exhibit. So, um, and as uh, another example, we're gonna have a story in the magazine about um, how the home economics staff um, studied homemakers and developed kitchen designs that would support the efficient completion of the common tasks of food preparation. So I see the magazine as kind of an organic item that can um, support uh, new initiatives uh, um, such as uh, materials. Um, I'm gonna have a story on school gardens. So this is not in any exhibit right now. So um, I'm gonna use the story as a, uh, uh, and a vehicle to get these items digitized um, and then um, hopefully build down an exhibit to the, uh, for the summer. So in this way, I see the magazine is kind of sitting in between our general collection and the exhibits. And I have the URLs for the, the public um, exhibits. And I guess we'll move on to questions. Okay, we have a couple minutes for questions for both of our presentations. If you'd like to go to the microphones on either sides of the room so we can um, make sure your, your questions and comments are captured for the recording. Thank you. Hang on. Can you give us access to the screen? It's, mm. Oh, thank you. Okay, you got it from here. Yes. Um, so I'll just show you a little bit of it because it is kind of long. But um, this is our final <laughs> deliverable for our class, and it, it's a personal reflection as opposed to um, a reflection on what, on like the stories themselves, but it could easily be tailored. And I did all of this in iMovie, and I had no prior experience editing or anything. So here we go. How great is this? Own it! I knew immediately that I wanted Otis to be the subject of my oral history project. I went back and forth trying to decide if the founders of the festival were a worthy subject, and I almost changed my topic entirely. But I wanted to interview the boys because I felt like we're so busy planning the event, 
We never get a chance to reflect back on it. And compared with the narrators my classmates have chosen, I have felt slightly uncomfortable with my subject choice. My narrators aren't serious, they're young, and they're relatively inexperienced. I almost felt like I had cheated the assignment just by interviewing my friends. Okay, that's just a little, little bit of it, but um, just to give you the idea that it's really easy to edit with photos and make it interactive and, and build something that your patrons will really want to use and look at. Yeah, Can sure. Can you say again what you used to create the videos? Oh, I used iMovie. So it's an Apple product, and it, it comes standard on all Apple devices. Like yeah, and it was really easy. And one of the girls in our class did it on her iPhone. She did, like, the whole story on her iPhone. So it, I think it's just, like, a really accessible product. And you can do still photos or add video and layer your sound onto it as well. It, it was really easy. Yeah. Anyone have any other questions? <laughs>